గుడ్ ఈవినింగ్ యాస్పిరెన్స్ వెల్కమ్ టు ది హిందీ న్యూస్ అనాలిసిస్ బ్రాట్ యూ బై శంకర్ ఐస్ అకాడమీ ఐ హ్యావ్ అన్ అనౌన్స్మెంట్ ఫర్ యూ ది ప్రిలిమ్స్ టెస్ట్ సిరీస్ ఆఫ్ శంకర్ ఐస్ అకాడమీ విచ్ ఇస్ ది ప్రీ స్టార్మింగ్ టెస్ట్ సిరీస్ ఇస్ స్టార్టింగ్ దిస్ మంత్ ట్వెల్త్ ఆఫ్ సెప్టెంబర్ అండ్ ది ఫస్ట్ టెస్ట్ విల్ బి ఆన్ నైన్టీన్త్ ఆఫ్ సెప్టెంబర్ ఐ నోట్ దాట్ దర్ విల్ బి టోటల్ నంబర్ ఆఫ్ సిక్స్టీ సిక్స్ టెస్ట్ ఇట్ విల్ ఇంక్లూడ్ జిఎస్ పేపర్స్ సీసాడ్ అలాంగ్ విత్ త్రీ మాక్ టెస్ట్ and this batch 1 of pre storming starting this month is available in offline mode on the scheduled dates from 2 pm to 4 pm it will be followed by live discussion on the same day but don't worry those students who have missed the offline test can take the test in the online mode after 2 days and for this recorded discussion will be provided and this facility of online mode test is available till the shankara is academy's prelims mock test for 2023 exam So don't miss this opportunity. We are here to aid you in your preparation for the prelims 2023 examination. Now let us come to the Hindu news analysis. Today we'll be covering the Hindu news articles taken from yesterday and today. And note that today there is no Hindu news edition. So I have taken articles from the website of the Hindu. These are the articles which I have taken. And the quiz question for today's discussion will be posted as a poll along with this video. So watch the discussions carefully and try to attend the poll also. So let us start a discussion now. So today we are going to start our news article discussion with this news article that has been taken from yesterday's newspaper. So the news is a team of researchers from the Indian Institute of Science has developed and tested a novel virus like particle. Here you have to focus on the term virus like particle in short VLP. The news is now the researchers are hoping to develop this virus like particle into a vaccine candidate. Now to understand why we need to know what is this virus like particle. See, these are molecules that mimic viruses, but they are not infectious. And these are particles of nanoscale size. So, this VLP, which is a small particle, it contains certain proteins from the outer coat of a virus. Here, the point to note is, they do not contain any genetic material from the virus, but it behaves like the virus. Okay, now since there is no genetic material from the original virus, this VLP also cannot cause an infection. Remember this fact, it doesn't contain a genetic material from the original virus and it cannot cause infection, even though it mimics the virus. Actually, the interest in these new VLPs was largely inspired by the successful development and introduction of two VLPs. The first VLP was based on the hepatitis B virus surface antigen. Here, this was used to develop a commercial vaccine against hepatitis B. The second one was the human papillomavirus capsid protein L1. This VLP was used to develop a commercial vaccine against HPV-induced cervical cancer. Now, let us know why there was a need for such a VLP. First of all, it is required for safely studying any virus. A take SARS-CoV-2 virus, for example. See, if you want to know the effect of mutations of SARS-CoV-2, then BSL-3 facility is required. What is BSL-3 facility? It is the Biosafety Level 3, which is applicable to clinical, diagnostic, teaching, research and production facilities. In BSL-3, work is performed with agents that may cause serious or potentially lethal disease through inhalation and it may contaminate the environment. And we know that SARS-CoV-2, which causes COVID-19 disease, is quite lethal. So, if you want to study that, then BSL-3 facility is needed. Now, in case we have a VLP, that is a virus-like particle based on SARS-CoV-2, then in that instance, there is no need for BSL-3 facility because it will not cause any infection. So, this is the first need. Now, the second need is the VLPs are used for making vaccines. This is mainly because they do not possess the genetic material of the original virus. So, they cannot proliferate or multiply inside the cell which they enter. Okay. Now, because of these two needs, VLPs are being developed. And currently, it is used in many other instances also. For example, they are used as carriers for delivery of biomaterials and nanomaterials such as drugs and vaccines. 
about vaccines we saw already now it is also used for delivery of drugs because it is a nano structured particle other than this vlps are also used in the treatment of many hereditary and acquired genetic disorders here they are used uh, in uh, different uh, gene therapy tools to treat these disorders and then as we already saw it is used for studying the viruses in a similar instance only the scientists from indian institute of science they wanted to study about the mutations and the ability to cause infections in the coronavirus so they used a vlp of coronavirus now here don't forget that i said it can be used as a vaccine this is not only because it do not possess a genetic material it is also because when they are introduced into the body it will trigger an immune response so here the person will not experience any symptoms of the virus to which they are being vaccinated against so these are the common benefits or uses of vlps now before seeing the news you should also know that there are certain key challenges associated with vlps the first one is lower stability but this can be resolved in future with the help of further research into this area and the second issue is the difficulty in downstream processing see downstream process refers to the recovery and the purification of virus to produce the vlps currently there is difficulty in this process this can also be resolved in the future with the use of advanced technologies other than this vlps include high production costs also and they are also sensitive to the environment so these are certain challenges associated with using vlps so with these basic information about vlp let us understand what the news article says see for the covid-19 virus which is the sars cov2 virus a vlp was artificially synthesized with all the four structural proteins of sars cov2 remember that sars cov2 has four important structural proteins See, these structural proteins are the ones which help in the viral genome production replication attachment to the receptor and it also promotes the virus's entry into the host organism and helps it to proliferate and thereby spreading the infection so these structural proteins are important for the viruses now coming to the covid-19 virus sars cov2 it has four structural proteins they are spike protein nucleocapsid proteins envelope proteins and membrane proteins now among these the envelope proteins and membrane proteins which are called e proteins and m proteins these form the viral envelope and then the nucleocapsid proteins which is the n protein it binds to the virus's rna genome and then the s protein which is a spike protein it binds to the human receptors okay now the vlp which was used using the sars cov2 it also had all these structural proteins and that is why now the researchers are hoping to develop it into a vaccine candidate so as i said in the beginning vlps are the molecules that mimic the viruses but they are not infectious so with these key points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion so for our second discussion i am taking up this editorial article as you can see it talks about the pegasus software see again this is a news because recently the committee that was uh, probing the allegations against this software has submitted its report this committee is the justice rv ravindran committee it was appointed by the supreme court to probe the allegations of unauthorized use of this pegasus software as you know this software belongs to an israeli group called as nso and it was used for surveillance in india now in its report this committee has said that during its examination it found no conclusive evidence on the use of the spyware in phones along with this it has also noted that the central government has not cooperated with the panel apart from these two facts other findings of the report were not made public and based on this only now the editorial has been written so basically the author of this editorial is not happy with the way the pegasus case is moving forward he even states that there is a misplaced hope on the supreme court so while talking about this the author has mentioned about the government surveillance and he has cited various good practices around the world to handle such a situation so in this discussion what we are going to do is we are not going to see about pegasus software rather we'll be seeing about the surveillance factor that is we'll be seeing what is government surveillance and we'll see what are the issues on it and the best practices around the world and we'll also see where india stands in government surveillance okay before that there is the syllabus that you can link with this uh, discussion take note of it see topics like this are quite important from the mains angle and the points which we are going to discuss today 
will help you directly in writing a comprehensive answer when the question asks you to talk about government surveillance or the measures needed to be taken against it when you talk about right to privacy etc let me get to the discussion without any delay first what is surveillance it is nothing but observing or monitoring a person now when the government collects information about people and organizations for the purpose of influencing directing and monitoring their actions then we call that surveillance as government surveillance okay see this government surveillance is not a new thing even in the medieval times the kings used to have spies to check on their subjects this was used to prevent people's rebellion at that time now with the advent of technology in the current time just the nature and form of surveillance has changed you would have seen in the 80s and early 90s hollywood movies that the fbi officials are sitting with binoculars across the street of mob bosses to observe their moves this is nothing but surveilling on the criminals but with the advancement of technology currently there is no need for the spy to be physically present at the location now the surveillance can be done from a remote location itself and in this the latest development is the digital surveillance see as you know the world is becoming increasingly digital so every possible step in the generation transmission and reception of digital data is stored somewhere now when this information is monitored by an organization then we call that as digital surveillance now such a digital surveillance can be done either by the government or even by a corporation when government does it we call it as government surveillance and when the corporation does it we call it as corporate surveillance okay but there are many issues with these kinds of surveillance especially with the digital surveillance you would have heard the quote if you haven't done anything wrong you have nothing to fear there is a typical argument used by the governments to justify its surveillance activities See on the face of it if you see this argument makes sense most people are law abiding citizens only and they will not be targeted for surveillance and it will not impact their lives from this we also assume that it is only the criminals who have to worry because surveillance enables the elimination of criminals and it saves the lives of law abiding citizens so on the face of it surveillance sounds not so bad and it even seems essential for a functioning society but if you dig deeper it gets uglier here i have to quote george orwell mr orwell said those who control the present control the past and those who control the past control the future let me repeat it again those who control the present control the past and those who control the past control the future and through surveillance this is what the government is trying to do see the governments are very interested in surveillance it is not only to eliminate the criminal elements from the society but also to control the citizens here by controlling the citizens i mean curbing their voices of dissent that is to stop them from opposing the policies of the government to be critical of uh, government moves all these are nothing but controlling the citizens and the governments does this to consolidate power this is done all around the globe so in this regard even the european court of human rights has said that a secret surveillance system can undermine or even destroy democracy under the cloak of defending it so from this it is clear that surveillance without any monitoring mechanism is very dangerous and it will attack the roots of democracy so the first issue with surveillance is it attacks democracy along with this surveillance also affects the freedom of press see right to freedom of speech and right to privacy are two important ingredients that enable good journalism based on a good and impartial journalism only a free press is built a free press is necessary for a well functioning democracy here the author also notes that the journalists are the ones who are particularly targeted for surveillance so through this the press freedom is affected this is why india ranks very low in the world press freedom index also in the recent 2021 index report india was ranked among the bottom 50 we were in the 142nd position out of 180 countries so freedom of press is affected by surveillance next right to privacy is also affected we know in our country article 19 of indian constitution guarantees the right to freedom of expression along with this article 21 ensures right to life and personal liberty now both these fundamental rights are affected by surveillance why because when the government is constantly breathing down your neck that is when the government is constantly monitoring your every move you cannot do things freely or even think freely even if you are doing nothing wrong so this affects our freedom to think and express and this is against the constitution guaranteed fundamental rights 
So the main three issues which we saw now were, first it attacks democracy, it affects freedom of press and also the right to privacy. Along with this, the issue of surveillance leads to the creation of a police state. See, the state-sponsored surveillance must be opposed in the initial stages itself. It is because surveillance is always a slippery slope. Once the government starts doing it, it starts consolidating its powers by eliminating the opposition. So through this, it can silence all the voices of dissent and this naturally turns the government into a police state. Apart from all this, surveillance also brings the issue of transparency. See, when the data is collected, whatever data that might be, it could be digital data or some other data, whether such data is used for its stated purpose is a big question. And this happens due to the lack of oversight. Even in the Pegasus case, the government did not cooperate with the Supreme Court appointed committee. We saw that. This shows that even the judiciary in our country is losing grip over the government in the issue of surveillance. So these are the main issues associated with surveillance. See, as I said, surveillance is not a new thing. And with the advent of technology, it is taking uh, many new avatars and it is practiced globally. So to address these issues, there are various international best practices. And some of them have been quoted by the author also. Let us see these one by one. See, mainly two US acts are relevant in this regard. The first act is the 1986 Wiretap Act of the USA. This act prohibited private agencies from engaging in surveillance in their country. Along with this, when the US government wants to engage with the surveillance activities, it has to ask the permission of the federal court. And this act also states that the government must engage in surveillance only when all other options are exhausted. So you can see how strict this act is against surveillance. The another important act of USA is the Patriot Act of 2001. See, this act was enacted to curb international terrorism. This act also says that before surveillance, approval from a court is necessary. So both these acts of USA ensures that when the government wants to do surveillance, it needs to get approval from the court of law. In addition to this, USA also has a separate officer that protects the civil liberties of its citizens. This officer is called as the Civil Liberties Protection Officer. This officer is made part of the Office of Director of National Intelligence of USA. And this officer directly reports to the US Congress. So when one of the civil liberties of a US citizen is affected, they can immediately approach the officer. Similarly, Australia also has an officer in this regard. It is the Office of Privacy Commissioner. This office will have inspectors who will investigate the complaints regarding privacy. See, these two examples of USA and Australia, from this, we can understand that they have separate offices to deal with the issues of privacy and to protect the civil liberties. But in India, we only have the Supreme Court of India because it is the guarantor and the defender of fundamental rights of Indian citizens. Other than that, the United Nations has also developed the legal framework of no secret rules. See, according to these rules, the government stating national interest to instigate surveillance is not good enough. So, according to the rules, the principle of maximum disclosure should govern the surveillance laws of a country. It also mentions that court warrant must be necessary for surveillance and notice should be given to those who are under surveillance. Along with this, details of surveillance must be kept meticulously and surveillance must be supervised by an independent body according to these rules. So, these are some of the international best practices that regulates surveillance. Now, where does India stand? Do we have any such act or officer that deals with surveillance issues? See, the status of India in surveillance could be understood by the report that was submitted by Justice B.N. Sri Krishna Committee in 2018. See, this report mentioned that much of the intelligence gathering in India does not happen under the ambit of law. It also stated that there is very little oversight and there is no proper checks and balances in India. So, this report itself has cited how surveillance is not being regulated. Along with this, a report published by Citizen Lab stated that the software such as Packet Shaper and Fin Fisher has been found on servers in India. So, these are surveillance softwares and they are being marketed exclusively to law enforcement agencies and intelligence agencies in our country. So, from this, it is clear that India is involved in surveillance without the concurrence of courts. Along with this, we should also keep in mind that in India, authorities authorize 9,000 interception orders every month. 
that is these orders enable them to intercept any communications but note these orders are not issued by the court but by police officers so it is against the international best practices and along with this we have the issue of facial recognition also see both the european union and the united states have stopped uh, facial recognition some times ago because they found that this technology is violative of human rights but in india we know that this technology is routinely used without any opposition even in my last discussion which was few days ago we had an elaborate understanding of the issues in facial recognition technology so this is the present condition in india from this what we can say is in india government surveillance is happening everyone knows that but there is no proper regulation so in the conclusion we should acknowledge that surveillance and intelligence gathering has certain merits but it should be under the ambit of international best practices so for this what is needed we need laws and those laws should make taking permission from courts mandatory before going forward with surveillance along with this such laws can also create an independent body to ensure that the data which is collected is only used for the stated purpose so if this is done then it will help us to strike a balance between the fundamental rights of the citizens and the national security so what is needed is first a law and also guidelines in this regard okay i hope you got a idea about what is government surveillance how it is done and how it affects various rights then we also saw what measures could be taken by india based on the best international practices with these points in mind we are moving to the next news article discussion i have taken this article from the website of the hindu because today there is no hindu newspaper edition see this news article reports about a much awaited report from the un office of high commissioner for human rights based on the conditions of uighur muslims in china so today let us understand who are these uighur muslims and what the report has to say see uighurs are a group of turkic speaking people of interior asia they mostly live in the northwestern china in the uighur autonomous region of xinjiang uighurs also live in central asian republics like uh, uzbekistan kazakhstan and kyrgyzstan see here the uighurs are among the oldest turkic speaking peoples of central asia they are even mentioned in chinese records from the 3rd century ce first they rose to prominence in the 8th century at that time they established a kingdom in the present day mongolia but from there they were overrun by the kyrgyz and later by the mongols so now let us understand what is the issue in china see as i said in china they are prominently present in the xinjiang province now this xinjiang is a autonomous region in china's northwest it was named as uighur autonomous region of xinjiang see the uighur autonomous region of xinjiang was established in 1955 and this region has around 10 million uighur uh, sunni muslims here you should note that in the 1950s the chinese government supported the migration of han chinese the han chinese are the majority ethnic group in china so because of this once uighurs were prominent in that region and now they only constitute around 47 percentage and because of this over time many uighurs have complained that hans have benefited disproportionately from economic development in xinjiang province this economic disparity and also the ethnic tensions between these two communities resulted in protests and other disturbances in the region even a violent outbreak happened in 2009 which killed nearly 200 people and most of them were han chinese so because of this the chinese government blamed these attack on a muslim separatist group founded by the militant uighurs of xinjiang province and as a result the chinese authorities retaliated by cracking down on uighurs and suspected every one of them being separatists this retaliation included shootings arrests and long jail sentences again in 2017 china initiated a thorough crackdown on uighurs in xinjiang here what they did was they started political training centers or reeducation camps they even established cameras checkpoints and constant police patrols in uighur dominated areas following this in 2017 again the xinjiang government passed an anti extremist law it prohibited people from growing long beards and wearing veils in public so like this china kept on curbing the rights of uighurs and it legitimizes its actions in the name of curbing uh, separatism and violent extremism but the rights group in the region alleged that in the education camps of chinese government uighurs are getting sinicized 
Sinicized means they are being forced to conform to the doctrines of Chinese Communist Party and to the customs of majority Han Chinese. So due to this, the interference of uh, UN was much awaited. And now the UN Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights has submitted a report regarding the conditions of Uyghurs in the Xinjiang province. In this report, the OHCHR, that is the Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights, has accused China that it is using vague and complex national security laws to curtail the rights of minorities and to establish systems of arbitrary detention. The report also highlights that Uyghurs are imprisoned in the name of re-education camps and they are being subjected to patterns of ill treatment which includes incidents of uh, sexual violence and gender-based violence. Along with that, in these camps, they are also facing forced medical treatments and discriminatory enforcement of family planning and birth control policies. And all these are done by the Chinese government in the context of application of counter-terrorism strategies and counter-extremism strategies. So the report has called these actions as serious human rights violations in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. So as a conclusion, the report has called for the Chinese government to take prompt steps to release all the individuals who were arbitrarily deprived of their liberty in the province. And it has also asked the government to inform the families about the details of the respective individuals. Okay, so from this report, it is clear that Chinese government has carried out widespread uh, human rights violations against Uyghur Muslims. You can compare this with the situation of Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar. Both are being religiously persecuted in their countries. So I hope you got an idea about what is going on in Xinjiang province against the Uyghur Muslims. With these points in mind, let us move on to the next article discussion. Now let us take up this news article. This one again appeared in yesterday's newspaper. See, it mentions that a group of petitions were filed in the Supreme Court and this challenged the constitutional validity of the practice of polygamy and nikah halala, which is allowed in Muslim personal law. See, under the petitions, a ban on polygamy and nikah halala has been demanded, saying that it renders the Muslim wives extremely insecure, vulnerable and it also infringes their fundamental rights. And now, according to the news article, a five-judge constitutional bench has postponed the hearing to these petitions. So, in today's discussion, let us understand what is this Muslim personal law we are talking about. And we also see the practice of polygamy and nikah halala among Muslims and how it violates fundamental rights. See, generally, personal laws are the ones which deal with personal issues like marriage, divorce, inheritance, custody of children, etc. In 1937, the British government passed the Muslim Personal Law Shariat Application Act. This one deals with Muslim social life such as marriage, divorce, inheritance and family relations. Now, this Shariat Application Act in India protects the application of Islamic laws in personal legal relationship. But the Act does not define the laws. It clearly states that in matters of personal dispute, the state shall not interfere and the religious authority would pass a declaration based on his interpretation of the Quran and the Hadith. Now, you may have a question whether only Muslims have personal laws. Actually, no. All other religions have personal laws also. The Hindus have the Hindu Succession Act of 1956, which lays guidelines for property, inheritance among Hindus, Muslims, Jains and Sikhs. Then we have the Parsi Marriage and Divorce Act of 1936. Then we have the Hindu Marriage Act of 1955. Apart from it, Christians and Jews are also governed by different personal laws. Now let us come to the issues in this Muslim Personal Law Shariat Application Act of 1937. So the main issue here is around Section 2 of this Act. This provision validates the practice of polygamy and nikah halala. According to the Sharia or the Muslim Personal Law, men are allowed to practice polygamy. That is, they can have more than one wife at the same time. And according to this law, they can have up to a total of four wives. Then what is nikah halala? It is a process in which a woman, after being divorced by triple talaq, marries another, consummates the marriage and then again gets divorced in order to able to remarry her former husband. That is the first husband. So, these two practices were challenged by the petitioners. They argued that they are violative of Article 14, 15 and 21 of Indian Constitution. They said it infringes the fundamental rights of Muslim wives. It also renders them extremely insecure and vulnerable. But to this petition, 
the all india muslim personal law board has provided an explanation saying that these personal laws do not derive its validity from legislature or any other competent authority they have said that the source of this law is their scriptural texts of their respective religions okay see if you look at the fundamental rights we can say that the muslim personal law is inconsistent with the fundamental rights so it can be struck down under article 13 of indian constitution see article 13 clause 1 states that laws which are inconsistent with the provisions of fundamental rights are null and void so now you may think that supreme court can easily strike down section 2 of the muslim personal law because it is against fundamental right but the issue here is personal laws does not fall within the definition of laws under article 13 clause 3 of the constitution see in the case law state of bombay versus narasu apamali the bombay high court mentioned that personal law wasn't included within the law as mentioned in article 13 but in the shah banu case where miss shah banu filed a case for alimony under crpc here the supreme court held that a muslim divorced woman is entitled to the benefits of section 125 of crpc and here the supreme court also noted that the crpc here overrides the personal law if there is any conflict between the two but the supreme court did not address the technical question of whether the personal law is a law as defined by the article 13 but note that later due to huge opposition from the muslim community the government of the day passed the muslim women protection of rights on divorce act and this act made it necessary for the husband to pay alimony to his muslim wife but only during the period of iddat that is 90 days after divorce so from this what we can understand is the applicability of the shariat law has always been under controversy the issue will come to an end only if the definition of the laws under article 13 clause 3 of indian constitution is expanded to include personal laws okay now let us wait and see what are the arguments put forward by both the sides when this petition is heard with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion now let me take this text and context article from yesterday's newspaper it talks about the special marriage act of 1954 see this is in spotlight because recently the supreme court has dismissed a writ petition which challenged the constitutional validity of certain provisions of this act so in this discussion let me tell you the objectives behind this act the provisions which were challenged and also the reasons behind it special marriages act of 1954 see this act was enacted to provide a special form of marriage in certain cases and for their registration and also to deal with other matters related to it including divorce so basically a marriage under this act allows people from two different religious backgrounds to come together in the bond of marriage and the act lays down the procedure for both solemnization and registration of marriage see here solemnization is nothing but the marriage ceremony involving the customs or practices etc now let us come to the provisions that were challenged first one which was challenged is section 5 of the act this section mandates to serve a notice of intended marriage see as per this section if a couple wants to get married then they have to give notice in writing and such a notice is to be given to the marriage of officer of the district in which at least one of the parties to the marriage has resided for a period of not less than 30 days now why this section is challenged it is because of the particulars in the notice see the notice is to be given as mentioned in second schedule to this act here i have given the second schedule you can see that this notice involves the particulars like the current address of the couples also so this gives an opportunity for the harassers or the anti social elements to harass the couples who belong to different religions now the second provision that is challenged is section 6 this one enables to maintain a marriage notice book by the marriage officer so this book is nothing but a record of all the notices that are given under section 5 but why this is challenged it is because of the clause 1 of this section so this clause mentions that such a book shall be open for inspection at all reasonable time by any person desirous of inspecting the same so that means whoever wants to inspect it can have access to this book therefore 
even the harassers or anti social elements can easily get the details of the couples now the next section which is challenged is section 7 See, it provides the process for making an objection in certain instances. For example, if the either party have a living spouse, or if either of them is incapable of giving consent due to unsoundness of their mind, or if either one of them is suffering from a mental disorder, etc., etc. Like this, certain instances are mentioned in this act. So, if any of these is present, then any person may object to the marriage within thirty days from the publication of notice under Section Five. So, because of this thirty days period. for objection only it is normally understood that the couples have to serve a notice with the relevant documents to the marriage officer 30 days before the intended date of marriage okay other than that there is no direct mention of you know the notice has to be served before 30 days and if there is no objection received under this section 7 then that marriage is solemnized see this section is challenged because the same does not happen in a marriage where couples belong to the same religion and also this 30 days period gives ample time for the harassers to get hold of the couples and separate them now the final section that was challenged is uh, section 8 this one specifies the enquiry procedure to be followed after an objection is submitted okay so from these sections it is clear that these provisions make the personal information of the individuals open to public scrutiny so the sections seriously violate one's right to have control over their personal information and its accessibility thereby it also violates right to privacy under article 21 of indian constitution other than that it also violates the right to marry a person as per one's wishes this is also a fundamental right under article 21 right other than that the provisions also contravene article 14 because it amounts to discrimination on the grounds of religion then article 15 is also violated because it violates the right to equality as the requirements under this act is absent in other personal laws so based on these issues only the writ petition was filed but supreme court has rejected the writ petition so from the above discussion we can clearly say that the provisions of special marriage act violates fundamental rights so what the government has to do is it has to reconsider the act and make necessary amendments to safeguard the privacy and rights of individuals okay so these are the points that you have to note from this discussion now let us get to the next one so our next discussion is going to be based on this opaid article as you can see the title mentions as hyperlapse consumerism yes this article talks about the issues in hyperlapse consumerism so first we'll understand what is this model of hyperlapse consumerism then we'll see the problems that has to be addressed let me tell you what do we mean by consumerism first see it is nothing but the belief that it is necessary to buy and use a lot of goods and services indiscriminately now the author of this opaid article has uh, given a new terminology called as hyperlapse consumerism and this is very much relevant in the age of e-commerce so this is a phenomenon in which ease of buying of the consumer and the swiftness of the delivery are given more importance this is called as hyperlapse consumerism that is here the consumer can buy a product easily and along with this even that product is delivered swiftly for example take zepto they were the ones who announced grocery deliveries in 10 minutes then it was followed by other delivery platforms like swiggy also danzo also see the hyperlapse consumerism is gaining so prominence that for example if you take swiggy it was initially a food delivery platform only but now it has a separate network for delivering provisions and vegetables that is swiggy instamart so these platforms zepto swiggy danzo they have enhanced the consumer experience because they can buy products with ease along with that they also provide swift delivery this is what the author is calling as hyperlapse consumerism now this has two main benefits first it gives rise to huge em- employment so according to recent data by niti aayog around 7.7 million workers were engaged in gig economy and this equals to about 1.5 percentage of total workforce of india as you know gig economy is nothing but a labor market in which employment is characterized by the prevalence of short term contracts or freelance works as opposed to permanent jobs so working in this delivery platforms like zepto and swiggy it is also a part of gig economy only so these platforms have contributed to the rise of gig economy now second benefit is if you see from this consumers angle ease of consuming 
has considerably increased because now we have faster deliveries and the shopping has been made impersonal without the need to be present physically to buy at the store but even though these two benefits have increased the prominence of hyperlapse consumerism there are certain issues with it first of all see this gig economy doesn't work based on employment contracts so the social security needs of employees are not taken care of and also there is indiscriminate working hours this leads to mental and physical health issues of the employees now second this has led to a change in the consumer behavior because now the consumers want speedier delivery so due to this now the delivery professionals might resort to reckless driving this will cause road safety concerns you would have even uh, come across the recent news that the 10 minute delivery plan of zepto was uh, opposed by all sections of the society so now the zepto has uh, rolled back in this plan and has changed the time from 10 to 20 minutes i think then the third issue is it leads to prolonged unsustainable consumption so it leads to environmental degradation for example it increases vehicular emissions because all these deliveries will be happening by operating vehicles only that uses fossil fuels so vehicular emissions will be increased because of this and if you see when you buy vegetables from these platforms they use lot of plastic so again single use plastic is increasing so due to this the environmentalists are calling or uh, they are advocating minimalism as opposed to consumerism see minimalism is nothing but consuming only necessary items that is consuming only what we need and leaving out luxury okay so these are the three issues with hyperlapse consumerism now let me tell you how these challenges can be addressed from the consumer side what we can do is consumers should resort to laid back delivery model see this laid back delivery model is nothing but the conventional delivery model as opposed to the hyper fast delivery now if consumers want this then the businesses will automatically go back to the conventional delivery model and here as consumers we should also remember that our convenience should not become hardship for delivery professionals and the common public and second from the business side it should be kept in mind that in a rush to be more competitive the businesses should not ignore ethical social environmental and safety concerns these concerns should be addressed in their policies and thus be made part of their decision making processes along with this we can also say that we need a proper legislation and policy in line to deal with this kind of consumerism so this was a small topic where we learned a new terminology called hyperlapse consumerism we saw some of the advantages of it issues with it and finally we saw two main ways to address the problems in it with these points in mind now let us get to the next discussion so our last discussion for today is going to be based on this news article it talks about the union environment minister's speech in the g20 environment and climate ministerial meeting so this meeting was held recently in bali in indonesia this meeting is particularly relevant for india because india will be taking up the g20 presidency in december 2022 now in this meeting the minister has said that india is showing intent as a problem solver in the climate change crisis mitigation here the minister has stressed this fact even though india is not a traditional contributor to global emissions but why the minister has said this this is based on the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities this is in short is called as cbdr rc so in this discussion we are going to just simply understand what is this cbdr rc first of all it is a principle of international environment law see this principle was set out in the united nations framework convention on climate change that is unfccc as per this principle all states are responsible for addressing global environmental destruction but they are not equally responsible so there is a difference in how much they are responsible now these differences are linked to two factors the first factor is the country's contribution to the greenhouse gas emissions and the second factor is the country's ability to address the greenhouse gas emissions here the emphasis is on greenhouse gas emissions because it is one of the leading factors to climate change now we know that around the world different countries have contributed uh, differently to the greenhouse gas emissions for example currently if you see china is the biggest emitter that emits uh, 26.4% of global greenhouse emissions it is followed by united states which emits 
12.5% of GHG. And third comes India, which emits 7.06%. And then comes the European Union, which emits 7.3% of global greenhouse gas emissions. See, this may be the current scenario where India is in the third position. But if you look historically, the concentration of carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas, it increased as a result of industrial revolution and exponential growth in manufacturing activities around the world. Along with this, deforestation, agriculture, fossil fuel use all contributed to carbon dioxide emissions. Even a recent data from Global Carbon Project has found that the top five countries that have produced the most carbon dioxide from 1975 to 2020 are the countries of United States of America, China, Russia, Germany and the United Kingdom. You can see that India is nowhere in this list. So that is why we say India is not a traditional contributor to the greenhouse gas emissions, even though we are currently one of the top contributors. Because we are in the development stage, we are a developing country. So by looking at the historic times, we can say that the countries of USA, China, Russia, Germany and UK have more responsibility to tackle the issue of uh, greenhouse gas emissions than any other countries in the world. So basically, what is the CBDRRC? That is the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. It is basically the principle which states the need for all states to take responsibility for global environmental problem. But it particularly notes that the degree of responsibility varies. And it varies according to two factors as we already saw, which led to economic development, emissions rating, and it also involves emissions history, the availability of technologies to address the issues of GHGs, etc. And currently, if you ask me where this CBDRRC is used, it is now mainly followed in the climate finance. What is climate finance? It refers to the local, national or transnational financing that is drawn from public, private and alternative sources of financing. Such finance seeks to support mitigation and adaption actions that will address climate change. You should note that the UNFCCC and the Kyoto Protocol along with the Paris Agreement, they all call for financial assistance from the countries with more financial resources to the countries that are less endowed and more vulnerable. For example, if you take the countries having more financial resources like USA, they should provide financial assistance to the more vulnerable countries like Africa. Here, it is clear that the climate financing is recognizing that the contribution of countries to climate change and their capacity to prevent it and their ability to cope with it varies enormously. And that is why it is saying countries having more financial resources should provide to the countries which are more vulnerable. So, this is basically based on the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. Okay, I hope you understood what this principle is. And India can contribute to reduce the emissions based on its share of GHG emissions. Okay. With these points in mind, we are moving to the next session, which is the practice questions discussion session. So let me take up the first practice question for today. This is a three statement question. First statement is virus like particles are called as virus filled shells. See, this statement is incorrect because virus like particles that is VLPs are known as viral empty shells. This is because they lack genetic material. So statement one is incorrect. Now statement two is the genetic particle is absent in the virus like particles. Just now we saw that it is absent. So this statement is correct. So from this itself we can arrive at the correct answer which is option B two only. So that means statement three is also incorrect. It mentions virus like particles cause infection. No, they don't. Since they lack the genetic material, it cannot cause infections. Okay. The correct answer is option B. Let me take the next question. Which of the following constitutes law under article 13 clause 3 of Indian constitution? See, this article deals with the laws inconsistent with fundamental rights or the laws which are in derogation of fundamental rights. And as per this article, if any law is inconsistent with the fundamental rights, then it can be declared null and void. So, which are the laws given here? First one is laws enacted by parliament or state legislature. Second one, ordinance passed by parliament or state legislatures. Third one, laws passed by competent authority before the commencement of constitution. See, all these three are considered as law under this article. Okay, so the correct answer is option D, 1, 2 and 3. Now, this next one is a pair-based question. On one side, communities are given. 
on the other side the country is given first one is rohingyas bangladesh second one is uyghurs china third one is kurds turkey see if you closely see these communities are being religiously persecuted in the given countries for example uyghurs are being persecuted in china kurds are being persecuted in turkey so these two pairs are correct whereas rohingyas they belong to myanmar and they are being persecuted in that country so they are fleeing myanmar okay so first pair is incorrect therefore the correct answer to this question is option b 2 and 3 only now as i said in the beginning of this video the quiz question based on today's discussion will be posted as a poll along with this video don't forget to attend that poll now i have uh, two mains question for you interested aspirants please write the answer and post it in the comment section so this brings us to the end of hindi news analysis for today if you like this video don't forget to like comment and share and also subscribe to shankar ice academy youtube channel for receiving updates related to current affairs thank you